is a presentation of the iRacing Esports Network. It started with an announcement in Leipzig, Germany. Porsche joining the World Championship Series of iRacing. And boy, did that statement make a statement of its own. $100,000 prize pool. And it leads us to this. The first round of the Porsche Pro Qualifying Series here from Belle Isle in Detroit. The situation is as follows. The 20 drivers who finished in the top half of the iRacing World Championship Grand Prix Series in 2018, they have an invitation to run in the Porsche World Championship. The other drivers, they've got to qualify in what is already proven to be the most competitive, the hardest, the biggest and the best qualifying series in iRacing history. So as iRacing enters its 10th year of existence, welcome and good afternoon. Welcome to Detroit. Will Vincent hosting the Porsche Pro Qualifying Series. Connery Maddock and Jack Styles will be on the call in just one moment's time. And let's reiterate that one more time. $100,000 prize pool to whoever wins well, whoever does well, shall we say, in the Porsche World Championship Series, which kicks off in just a couple of months. Qualifying is already underway. Let's hand it over to Conry Manick and Jack Styles. Thank you very, very much, Will. It's the moment many of these drivers have been waiting for, the opportunity to get themselves qualified into what is basically the biggest series on iRacing, one of the biggest series in the whole of sim racing as well. And now it is go time. We'll have a couple of minutes of qualifying left, two laps for these drivers to get their laps up onto the board. And then we'll have a 30 minute sprint race to sort everything out. That is how it stands. Those are the track conditions we've got. We've got uh, what is going to be 19 degree, 18 degree track temperature, 22 degrees uh, further up as well. But looking at things as they stand up onto the board, the qualifying times will start to go though. Max Maximilian Venig will be pipped by Patrick Holtzman to provisional pole position with Marcel Luhner getting a fantastic time in there as well. So the first flurry of lap time starting to come in, Jack. This is where it all starts to count and it's going to be the qualifying position that's going to be extremely important today. Belle Isle is a very tight and twisty circuit, very difficult to overtake on. Many overtaken opportunities, the only ones which I can really recall are into turn three and at the end of the straight into turn number seven. So that qualifying position, which at the moment Alexander Thiebe is on pole, a one minute 28.548 is going to put him at the top of the standings at the moment as it stands, and he is in the best position going forward. Beneke, we were riding on board for it. Pole position for Mr. 10K I rating. The highest I rated driver on the roadside of things stamps his authority on this one. Almost one and a half tenths of a second advantage uh, in terms of his pole position time. But we still got a couple of other drivers to head their way through. We've got a uh, driver of Enzo Benito uh, looking to improve on 12th on the grid right now. It does have a little bit of damage to that uh, right front. He does have to be concerned about 
but let's just see how this lap goes. He's coming up through the final couple of corners right now, these two last right-handers. Just we got to be so, so careful not to hit the walls here uh, at Belle Isle. It's basically, a, well, it is a street circuit, so you just have to keep within the track limits, otherwise you will be inside a concrete wall. But Enzo Benito then across the line, what does he do? A 128.8. That is not going to improve in terms of its position. Ricardo Castelledo qualifies good enough for 13th for the VRS kind of sim sport team. But we're still waiting for the likes of Jack Cedric, Logan Clampett. We're waiting for Freddy Rasmussen as well, who seems to have aborted his first lap. So that's not going to be the start that Freddy would have wanted. Let's hope he can, for his sake that he can get a time on the board here, Jack. Yeah, then for Freddy Rasmussen... Oh, yes, still yes. Oh, he has indeed. So not a great start to his campaign in the Porsche qualifying Pro Series for Frederick. I'm sure he'll be able to pick himself up throughout the race. Number two car, so he is possibly one of the people to watch. It's got to be worth mentioning. Um, I know I've already mentioned him once, I'm going to mention him again. Max Beneke, he is almost certainly one to watch. But I think an underdog that you could watch out for today, Connery, is going to be Marin Kolak. He's an ex-world mm. touring car driver. So he has got the racing skills, especially on these street circuits. He has got the experience at the likes of Macau and Belle Isle. It might be a bit wider and it's a completely different country, but it's going to be those same skills that he's going to need to get him further up the pack. Yeah, it is. And we are drawing very, very close to the end of qualifying here. We've got Ricardo Castelledo who can do his second lap. We've got Evo Howler as well uh, on his second qualifying lap. So let's see how these drivers are starting to, uh, you know, be a little bit concerned they only have one lap to do and uh, if they mess it up well they won't be improving any further we've got non-qualifiers though we've got freddy rasmussen unfortunately for him has not qualified with paul waiting for yoni hyken and jack sedgwick to head their way through but in terms of everything else, Sebastian Dunkel won't get himself a lap time on the board either. But we're watching Jack Cedric right now. Let's see what he is able to do. Had a fantastic run, or at least what was looking to be a fantastic run in the Porsche Sim Racing Summit coming from behind in one of the latter uh, semifinals. But unfortunately, wasn't able to happen. But can it happen here in this series across the line? What position is he good enough to get? It's good enough for 16th on the grid right now for Jack Sedgwick. Uh, just bottom, uh, well, sort of towards the rear of the mid pack there for Jack. We've got Joni Heikkinen, who's the last driver out there looking to set himself a lap time onto the board. He's coming through the last couple of corners now. He's plenty of time to work with 45 seconds on the clock for the finished driver. Careful not to tap the wall. That will just invalidate your lap time here in iRacing through the final corner. He'll go and across the line, a 129.1, only good enough for 18th on the starting grid here. Yeah, and when we're talking about drivers of the caliber of Yoni Heikkinen, Oli Parkla, uh, drivers like Juan Lopez and Zabonito finishing, or at least qualifying bottom of the, uh, his bottom half of the pack here, Jack, that just says everything about how strong this field is. This, this series is so strong. The top end of the series is so difficult to even get up the front. And I think being able to say, yeah, I won at least won one race in this series over the course of the next nine weeks is going to be an achievement in itself. And it's going to provide with some absolutely fantastic racing. Here comes your starting grid then as they are up behind the pace car. It's going to be Maximilian Benecke. Pole position by two hundredths of a second over Jared Philsell. We've got Alexandra Thebe lining up in P number three with Marin Kolak there back in P number four. Row number three will look like this. It looks like Morris Lona, Patrick Holtzman making an all DH row with Maximilian Venig and Gianni Vecchio doing the same right behind. Joshua Anderson and Ivo Howler bring things down to your top 10 qualifiers with Dennis Kabrowski and uh, the driver of Anhyan Guven there in P number 12. Enzo Benito lines himself up in P number 13 with Juan E. Lopez. P number 14 as we cycle things even further back. It's going to be uh, Ricardo Castroledo and Jack Sedgwick bringing things down to P number 16 with Kamel Franjak, Yoni Heikkinen, Oli Pakler, and Dimitri Yanis bringing things down to P number 20. And then you've got your stragglers right at the back of the field. Justin Brunner and Logan Clampett, the slowest qualifiers, with Freddy Rasmussen and Sebastian Dunkel 
not setting qualifying times. That is going to be very in, a very interesting thing to note here. We will actually have a standing start here in this one. So about 30 seconds away from getting this one underway. Of course, drivers can speed that up by getting to the starting grid quicker. But this is going to be a frantic, frantic start. Turn one comes up on you very, very quickly indeed and isn't a heavy braking zone at all. So they'll have to be careful. They'll have to tiptoe their way all the way through there while side by side with their competitors and then look for the braking zone down in towards turn number three. The qualifying series for a new era in art racing, in sim racing as well, gets underway right now. And it's a good start from pole position from Maximilian Bonnecke. Slots himself ahead of Jared Philsell as everyone gets very single file very, very quickly. Vernig battling with Magic Holtzman. Holtzman gets punted towards the outside of the track, has to spin in the middle of the traffic and gets collected there by uh, what was a vendor of our sim racing car. Didn't quite spot it, but the battles will continue down towards P turn number three. Everyone at the front of the field seems okay but they're side by side between Enzo Benito and Jack Cedric further back through the field. Enzo Benito is going to uh, come out on top of that particular battle as they head their way through towards the end of the first sector for the first time and then on to the back straight as well. Everyone's calmed down but that was a huge incident right at the start there Jack. That was and we just had Ricardo Castroledo from the front of the field, the number three machine on his roof. Looks as though the other driver involved in the incident with Patrick Holzman at the start was Joshua Anderson, the number 21. That car is now crabbing heavily. The live pictures you're currently seeing is of the front runners. In fact, we are going to get a replay up on your screen. This is of the incident for Ricardo Castroledo. Oh, and wow, that is not an accident you want to have on the first lap. An impressive flip from the Frenchman and that brings to a halt his effort. You can just see it just looks as though everyone was trying to get themselves into the same position on the track, Connery, and, well, there wasn't any room. Yeah, that was pretty close to the back of the field there. That was a huge instant for Castelletto going up and over and into the barriers. What catastrophic way uh, to finish a race. Uh, meanwhile, you've got Freddy Rasmussen at the back of the field. Does have a little bit of front-end damage after trying to avoid all the instants that were happening in front of him uh, on that start. But he is still running. But we're watching the battle involving Marx Luna and others right now. We've got he's trying to chase down Marin Cholak. And he'll look maybe for the opportunity down in towards turn number three, but not close enough to be able to sling it alongside just yet. And you have to remember, he is having a little bit of pressure from behind from Maximilian Venig from uh, Pure Racing Team. But we're riding on board with your driver MP number two right now, the Australian driver Phil Sell, trying to chase down uh, Maximilian Beneke. It's not an easy feat at all, but um, it's going to be a challenge that Phil Sell will very, very much try to take as he'll sit in the draft all the way down the back straight and uh, not look for the options just yet, not close enough, but... Uh, it's still going to be a fantastic point to finish there if he finishes in P number two. But with Gianni Vecchio right now, he's looking to make his way further up inside that top ten. Has his teammate of Maximilian Wernig ahead of him. So is this a situation where you do go aggressive with your teammate or do you just uh, stick to the more team order strategy? It is it's a half an hour race and especially with the fact that Vecchio might have teammates around him that can help him or even hinder him a little bit, it's going to be down to what the driver thinks is best as they head themselves through the double right-hander. Very tricky this one actually in the Porsche Cup car. The Cup car of course doesn't have traction control and doesn't have ABS so it's all about how much the driver is able to get the car around the, the track fast, uh, faster than anyone else and as well. The setup is very restricted on this car. It's almost a fixed setup Connery. It's very difficult to get this car set up to be extremely fast, extremely gripping. You have to be very careful. So we're now running on board with the number 16 and Maximilian Venig. Ahead of him, you can see Moritz Lona in the Williams eSports car. And at the moment, everyone just deciding to stay single file. Yeah, Maximilian Venig, one of the winners of the Porsche Sim Racing Summit, taking home a good chunk of cash in that one on the order of 7,500 euros going to his name. But the prize on offer for the series that you qualify into. If you do well in this one, well, that is a whole lot more. He's in a pretty good position, solidly inside of that top 10 for now, but he does have positions on the cars of the game if he decides to go chasing for a March Lona, the Williams eSports driver uh, ahead of him. Did not compete in that uh, Porsche Sim Racing Summit. Uh, oh, excuse me, did compete in the Sim Racing Summit, but it didn't go really well for March Lona there so let's see if he's able to try and bring things back then in this one we'll have a replay up on the screen for you now because something has happened to freddy rasmussen let's see 
That's coming down in towards the end of the pack straight, trying to go for the pass over Camel Franchak, but simply was not able to work. Franchak able to defend that one, coming down on towards the breaking zone. So uh, Freddy's recovery drive has gone, uh, well, it's, I wouldn't say it's gone well, but it's gone all right, I would say. He's up into P number 15, but really he needs to be inside the top 10 to score any reasonable points. And he is up nine positions already. It from the start of this race in the first three laps as we ride on board with Jack Sedgwick putting the pressure onto Enzo Benito. So Rasmussen really trying to get his way up as well as Sedgwick going to the outside of Benito into turn number three. Not the great line. You can see side by side racing up ahead. And I think for Sedgwick, as we get a nice portion of opposite lock going the other way, coming out of the corner. Just couldn't get the move done. Replay up on your screen from the helicopter. This is for the battle ahead. This is the battle between, I believe, Evo Howler and the driver of um, Guven as they just head into turn number three. Up the inside goes Guven, and I think it actually was a two-corner move there, Connery. Nice move into turn number four, and he's up into ninth position. Yep, exactly. Fantastic pass there from the driver of Guven. They're going to stack up once again as they head towards the end of the back straight and into this sort of relatively slow speed middle sector before you head towards your final sector and your final couple of corners. Jack Cedric looking aggressive all over the back bumper of Enzo Benito here. Better line in towards uh, some of the final corners here for Jack Cedric, but not able to capitalize on that one. There's a cast burn off behind though. I have to see, I have to cycle myself back to see who that one is. And that's gonna be Frederick Rasmussen. Things have gone from bad to worse, a bad qualifying. And what has happened here to Freddy? Let's have a look on board with him on the replay. Oh, just a single car spin has ruined it all for Rasmussen. He'll be cycled all the way to the back of your current runners, and that is going to be a pittance of points recovered from this race, unless he's able to do miracles in the next 20 or so minutes. It looks as though I think Freddie Rasmussen has called it a day. He's taken himself back to the pit lane and is not going to be continuing on, on with this one. So we've lost one of your front runners and one of your race favorites within the first 10 minutes. Currently looking back from the number one, Maximilian Benecke towards Jared Philsell. This is a battle I've been keeping an eye on for the last couple of laps. Philsell is closing the gap down, Connery, getting closer and closer. He also has the fastest lap of the race. He has been quicker over one lap than Maximilian Benecke. Philsell is absolutely on fire right now and uh, that is uh, not a thing you want to hear if you're Maximin Benecki, even though you have all of your experience, all of your uh, race wins in previous events. If you're Maximin Benecki, if you have uh, Phil Sell behind you and he's looking pretty spicy, then that is a scary prospect for absolutely everyone involved. As it is a two car breakaway at the front right now between Benecki and Phil Sell. Everyone else is stacked up behind Alexander Thieb right now. You'll have your top eight up on your screen right now. So it's Benecki, Phil Sell, Thieb. We've got Kolak, Wunder, Wet, Fennig, Vecchio and Guven are uh, your top eight drivers at this moment in time as we get on to lap number six of the event. But uh, this, this sort of uh, battle for the sort of last podium positions here, Jack, is where most of the action is going to be happening right now because Alexander Thieb, he does have a decent buffer buffer over Kolak, but the thing is that all these drivers are getting stacked up behind right now because Moritz Lohner is definitely looking very, very competitive in this one. you got Wernig, who's not a slouch either. Same with Gianni Vecchio. So the two pure racing teams, at, team cars at the back of this train could cause some issues from the front. You've got some of iRacing's best GT drivers in a five-car train. You can't ask for anything more exciting here on RaceBot TV, and you can just see as they're heading themselves down, the gap between Phil Sell and Thebe, second and third, is three and a half seconds. So Phil Sell hasn't got the worry from behind. He can come straight ahead as it looks as though Moritz Loder may have made contact with the driver of Marin Kolak into turn number seven. Doesn't look like much damage was done, though. Replay up on your screen. Riding on board with Loner, it was either a very close move or it was a slight touch, a little bit later on the brakes as they head themselves down into the braking zone. Now much later on the brakes of Moritz Lona, and very close to the back of Marin Kolak. Kolak has got some wing damage as well, Connery. That's not uncommon at Belle Isle. I know for a fact that I think half the field has got wing damage where those concrete walls can be very um, inviting at some point. They very much are basically the American version of Monaco in terms of how the walls do play a factor 
here. We're riding on board with Jack Cedric right now, trying to chase down Enzo Benito to get uh, himself inside of that top 10. Looks at a good run out of turn number two, which can set you up for all of this run down towards turn number three. And then you can hit the brakes and try and draw yourself alongside. Cedric will try to maybe look for it. The body language of the car suggested it, but simply too far back at this stage to be able to do anything uh, for the NX driver. But having a look back towards that battle involving Lohner, and Lohner, oh, he almost gets a pump from the rear from Maximilian Wernig. There has to be so, so careful with how how uh, you know, sort of everyone's in close proximity here. So if even if you're slightly off the pace coming through one particular corner, you're going to have someone right onto your back bumper. But Lona now, he's going to be looking for the move over Maran Chola here, maybe down in towards the right. Going to sense the opportunity, but the opportunity hasn't been taken just yet into the slow speed section now as these cars all stack up. Absolutely knows their tail. Morris Lona doesn't have much room to negotiate himself here as he tries to go through, but uh, Lona, he's still not able to get past Kolak, and Kolak's holding on very, very well. That's the real life uh, racing driver experience coming into play. And Moritz Lona did go for a move into turn number three on this lap. Wasn't quite able to get it done. Olak just had a little bit more drive off the corner. I think you were able to see it a little bit more there coming out of the double right-hander. Kolak seems to have a very good drive off the corners, Connery. Something about that car is working very well for him. Riding on board with Lona now in the number 17 Williams eSports machine. Looking forward to fourth position. Heading through the wall. Slight contact with the wall by the looks of things. And that is just how difficult it is. There's a nice little bump on the exit of turn two as well, Connery, that you do have to be careful. And of course, quite a famous incident happened there last year at the Belle Isle circuit. And hoping we won't see that repeated again today at any point in this event. Hopefully we won't see it as we see these guys go by. This is the battle for your final podium position or positions further up the field. But you can see that uh, everyone inside the top five has not changed position uh, based on their qualifying. But everyone else behind has been uh, jostling and changing. We've got uh, Jack Cedric actually up five positions there. We've got Logan Clampett up five positions as well up into P number 17. Then you have the biggest losers at the back of the field. Joshua Anderson down 12, Patrick Altman down 16, and we've got Ricardo Castelledo there down eight positions as well. So that is how things go in this one right now. All these cars still absolutely stacked up. And I think this is the point in the race where everyone's just sort of uh, calm down a little bit. We're getting towards the midpoint of the race, but if there's a if there's going to be a flashpoint at any point in this race, it's going to be somewhere inside of that top five train. And I have a feeling I do agree with you as well. And I think the last 10 minutes of this event, you'll see everyone start to ramp up the heat level once again, try a few more desperate moves, especially in the last few laps, the closing minutes of the event, because every point is critical in this series. It's only the top 20 who will qualify for the World Champion chip and will join the other 20 drivers who have already qualified from last year's Irish World Championship Grand Prix Series in that chance to win $100,000. That is a life-changing amount of money for any of these drivers who will qualify for that series. Absolutely. Of course, it's a share of $100,000. The winner won't get $100,000, but the thing is they will get a decent chunk of that money and uh, pretty much uh, a year's earnings in a decent paying job, we have to argue. But uh, Gianni Vecchio right now, we're riding on board with one of the pure racing team drivers there. He's got his teammate ahead of him and uh, uh, you know, Vecchio has been very, very well behaved in this one so far, right at the back of this train, just not really good at being very aggressive with his teammate. But I think uh, if Venick feels that Vecchio is faster in this situation, he might just uh, have it in his mind to try and let him buy and then try and go and chase those positions further down the road. We'll just have to wait and see what happens in terms of that one. But uh, these guys so close in terms of pace, so close on the racetrack as well. It's hard to tell whether uh, these moves will be happening or not. But later on in the race, when the desperation starts to set in to get those final you know, couple more points to get yourself further up the leaderboard, well, then that is when things start to get very, very interesting indeed. Jenny Vecchio hit the wall coming up the final corner last time. Only a slight tap with the wall, though, so it's not a huge issue uh, for Vecchio right now. But, uh, you know, those things, sort of things do start to add up. If you've been tapping the wall every, uh, you know, once or, once or twice a lap, every lap, that damage does start to accumulate and then you do start to feel it. Yeah, and especially with the aero damage, that the straight line capabilities through the fast sections and also through the slower sections as well, through the corners, is going to start harming these drivers. And it might 
you might find that some people might just be able to pull away. This large group that we have been following has now been joined by the number 12 machine of Guvan. We're looking at a replay of Enzo Benito coming down into turn three by the looks of it. He's got the 19 car up the inside. That's Jack Sedgwick. And oh my word, there was contact into the wall he goes. A nice light touch by the looks of things. So Benito is back underway. Not much harm done. Riding on board this time. You can just see there's Sedgwick on the inside. There's the contact. And there's the tyre wall. Lucky that wasn't a concrete wall, actually. That could have really done some damage to his steering. Yep, exactly. The tyre walls have a, a, a little bit of gear, even though it doesn't look like, on the iRacing service. But Enzo Benito will get himself um, off and away and uh, going once again. He's down into P number 12, which is still an improvement on his qualifying. Good start in P number 13. But uh, losing those two positions isn't going to help in terms of his championship standings at all that show oh i just spotted it on my screen uh oh, he has a big 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 moment coming through uh you know the second to last corner there just getting this back end that was sliding all the way and somehow manages to keep position although he does have guven right all over his rear end right now and will have the split stream all the way down towards turn number three but uh Vecchio will be able to recover that one but that was a very particularly scary moment there for Gianni Vecchio coming uh, on towards the end of the last time you just saw the tail end of it there from Vecchio but uh, that is not what you want to be having in a race that's as, as important as this we just saw it up on your screen for you right now we'll just get back towards the live pictures now and uh, Vecchio he'll try to recover from that particular slide that is going to cause a little bit of excess tire heating that he does have to be have to contend with so he does have to wait for those to uh cool down somewhat before he goes on to the attack once again we're looking at the front of this train right now though with Polak we've got Marx Lona involved in this as well these guys have been battling all race long but there's no sign that Lona is able to make his way through just yet looking for the exit off of the right hander simply not able to get it right now for Marcelino. We're riding on board, though, uh, with Kolak, who in turn is also trying to chase down Alexander Thie, but Thieb's done a very, very good job right at the front of this train of just managing the gap to all of the cars behind him. But we've got to look towards the race lead as well because that is going to be uh, it's starting to spread out a little bit. It was starting to get close just a couple of laps ago, but Maxim Bnecke has managed to get himself a second gap over Jared Philsell right now. You can just see on the lap deltas that he's been chipping away a tenth of a second a lap uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of his lead extension, excuse me, at the front of the field. So Beneke in a very, very comfortable place right now at the front to score maximum points in this 7,549 strength of field stretch. And Phil Sell is doing extremely well to hold on. You can see his last three laps haven't quite been up to the same pace as Maximilian Beneke, and that's been the case for probably about the last seven or eight laps actually i don't think that phil sell has quite got the pace of Beneke. but you know what he's still there and he's still holding off so alexander thebe has got nothing to answer he's six seconds behind though he does have a nice long train behind him of cars which he does have to try and fend off and he's been going to be brought back. he's actually been brought back into this battle now by the looks of things yeah he definitely has Alexander Thieb starting to feel the pressure from behind. I was singing his praises just uh, before we went to you there, but obviously something has brought him back into the clutches of this pack, and uh, Kolak will be particularly particularly ruthless in terms of that one. They'll get themselves up towards the final corner then. Going to complete lap number 12 of this event up until lap number 13, so we're coming up to what is going to be 12 minutes to go in this one, and things can definitely still change. Uh, for pretty major points inside of the top five, but just uh, just watching, just waiting to, for any of these drivers to get themselves an opportunity. We do have a driver going defensive, though. That's going to be Gianni Vecchio going to, more towards the middle line, coming in, in towards turn number three. Guven is going to be all over the back of him, and Guven might even have the opportunity of four. Nope, he's not going to take it just yet. Uh, the confines of this track do mean that uh, you do not have a lot of room to work with if you do want to go for the passes. Guven, he does tap the wall on the exit of the corner then. Just have to be careful, very, very careful indeed. Struggles to get the power down off onto the back straight as well. But that is just one of the problems with this racetrack track is that even if you do go for the move, it's such a tight affair on entry. And then on exit, you've got the concrete wall to worry about. It's really, really tough. 
And as soon as Vecchio moved himself just slightly offline, actually, he's prevented Guven even trying to go down the inside. Because for Guven to go down the inside, he would have to get onto the other side of the racetrack. Now, that part of the racetrack on the run up to turn three is one, one of the widest sections of this circuit. And to get yourself over to the other side of the track, stop the car, get through the corner, and not have an incident or any trouble getting on the power, especially with such a tight line through turn three, it is very difficult, very difficult to be able to manage. And I have a feeling that Vecchio would have just been able to hold off over Guven, and Guven would have been stuck back in eighth position. He's actually dropped back just a little bit now as they head into turn one. Riding on board with Jack Sedgwick. Sedgwick has been really on the move. Uh, starts his 16th, currently running in 10th, and he's running faster than Evo Howler ahead. I'm not sure whether Howler's going to be able to defend for too much longer. Jack Sedgwick on the run up to turn three. I don't think he's going to be close enough to put a move down the inside this time, Connery. He'd have to go very late on the brakes, and that is definitely not what he wants to do. There will have to be stamp licking, there will have to be sending, but not in this opportunity for Jack Sedgwick, as he's one of the best drivers in this sort of situation. And when he's out of position in terms of either his qualifying or if he's had an incident early on, he's one of those drivers that can really just put the hard work in and get himself further up the field when required. And that's exactly what he has done, done so far. But riding on board with uh, what's well, going to be Camel Fanshack right now, even further behind this battle, he's involved in his own fight with Enzo Benito, who does have a little bit of damage to the front end. So his car is not looking entirely healthy, is Benito's. But Fanshack will look to capitalize on that one as he heads his, himself into that slow speed sector right in the middle of the lap so that's those are the two battles to keep an eye on right now Cedric versus Howler, Franjak versus Bonito are your main course right now shall we say but Franjak getting very very close to the back bumper of Benito off of the slow speed sector he'll have a pretty good run coming through these final couple of corners now and might even have to hold it out until turn number three arrives next time but uh, Franjak definitely is looking very very good here and might even be able to gain the position Jack. He does look like he's going to be able, might be able to do so. Obviously, Emto Benito, that little bit of damage, the 15 looking through turn one and two, but not going to be able to get a move done. Very tricky to get a move done at that section of the corner, running back on board with the number 15. The speed on the side of your screen, powered by ATVO. Moving oh, to the middle of the track, goes Emto Benito, no. there's contact. Franjak is around through turn number three, so is Benito. Past goes the driver of Oli Pakala. So Oli Pakala is going to go up two positions. There's one other driver now coming into the mix. He's come out behind. Replay up on your screen. Yeah, oh, that is a, certainly a very interesting one. You see Edson Benito taking the middle line. Of, oh, he's just... I'm not even sure what to make of that one. I don't know what uh, you think of that one, Jack. But Enzo Benito, he broke a quite a bit early there. I don't think Franchak was expecting it. He was expecting to maybe cut back towards the outside to take, take a, a line into the corner. Wasn't expecting Benito to break so early and then just simply just run straight into the back of him. I'm not sure. I don't know whether it is. It, literally, all it needs to be is two, three tenths of a second later that Enzo Benito or Franchak would have got on the brakes and or earlier, sorry, would have got on the brakes and the instant would have been avoided. It's... It's so close, the timings on that one. I think you have to put it down to a racing instant, and it's an unfortunate one at that. Franchak, he was running up the rear of Benito, and that is one of the risks you take when you're doing things like this, especially at these street circuits. You have to. You have no other choice, because diving it down the inside is really the only way that you're ever going to be able to get past, and I have a feeling that Franchak may have just miscalculated that one back with this battle for third position now. You can see... The driver of Alexander Thebes still holding a good gap over Marin Kolak of about eight, nine tenths of a second. But you can see that Kolak clearly hasn't given up because he's still pushing that car hard. Very much so. A close uh, run of things behind, though, between the likes of Vene Ganvecchio. But, of course, these two teammates, they uh, won't battle it out too fiercely. Although we do have Cedric and Howler uh, that uh, is a battle further down. And Cedric trying to solidify his position. Uh, inside the top 10 here has been so so good over the past couple of laps but hasn't quite had that edge so far to get himself uh, past uh, Howler so we'll have to see how he gets on in the final couple of minutes of this event and very close up and towards the slow speed sector, sector he goes but you see lap number 15 that's pretty much the only time that he has lost time over Howler over the past five or so laps so that is going to be an effect of just him getting into a position where he can't, simply can't go any faster because he has a car ahead of him at this point. Yeah, and I think that having that car ahead of him is going to slow him down. Obviously, 
got a little bit more work to do to catch up to this group which are currently battling for third but it's not out of the question six minutes remaining sideways from Sedgwick out of the double right hand that shows really how hard he's pushing that the number 19 machine cross the line he comes to start lap number 17 according to my timing screens we have five laps remaining in this one and one of the exciting five laps is going to be is Sedgwick going to be close enough to Evo Howler he's in the wall again coming Sedgwick. out of turn number two and that was a hard hit with the wall for Jack Sedgwick Yep, it was. We'll cut it. Cut our cameras back to it. We'll get the replay up on screen for you now. Out of turn number two, Jack Sedgwick making friends with the concrete wall. We'll see it up on your screen for you now. Jack's out a little bit too much. That's a simple case there. Does have some right hand, uh, dry, right hand side bodywork damage uh, there for Sedgwick. And you'll see it once again. Bap, hits the wall. Able to get away with it though. No major damage to that car, but. As we, have already, as we have already said, that damage does start to accumulate with the more times that you do hit that wall. But looking further forward to that battle for the top five positions. Mark Sloan are trying to defend now for Maximum Venek because Polak, he's basically um, started to get himself away at the front of this train right now, trying to chase down Alexander Thebes. So now Mark Sloan has to be more looking behind than he is looking in front right now because Venek is on a charge. Two tenths of a second advantage last time by. Venig is really pushing that car power and as you said Moritz Lona is not worrying about I think he's got his mirrors full now of the PRT machine and not much and not not sure whether he's gonna be able to do they have been pretty solid running in a nice line of stern group for the last 10 or so laps not much been going on in this one so it might just stay that way they're just gonna try and get a good points finish here of course this is nine weeks long this series this is only the first week of the Pro Series qualifiers, so they might be thinking, play the long game, just get the points and move forward to next week. Or they might be thinking, let's get as many points as possible, get a good position early on, so we can just try and do the long game a little bit later on in the season. Uh, I'm not sure what, what, what strategy these drivers are going to be doing. It's quite hard to tell from the first race, but we'll get an idea in a couple of weeks' time as they head themselves onto the back straight. Contact oh, from you. Maximilian Venick and Moritz Lohner. Vecchio number eight, he hit the wall, and now Anton uh, and Guven's going to head his way through, but can Vecchio reply on here on this one at the end of the back straight? He's looking for the move, but simply not able to find a line into the corner. And now Guven capitalized on Vecchio's mistake there, coming on towards the back straight. We'll see a replay up on your screen for you right about now, as we'll cycle things back to Gianni Vecchio. Actually hits the inside of the wall instead of the outside of the wall, punts him towards the outside of the track. Fantastic heads-up driving there from Guven to, for not running into the back of him and then instead trying to take the opportunity all the way down the back straight and that is a position successfully gained there from Guven we'll see the end of it there as they get as Guven gets his, uh, himself past Gianni Vecchio just has to take that one on the chin and sell for that position just for now and look to maybe get it back in the last couple of minutes yeah yeah that was a nice move by Guven well avoided the driver of Vecchio and Vecchio actually to keep it going make it the minimal contact he did that could have been far worse what he did to that poor number eight machine but it's still carrying on you can see at the back of the field he's going to the inside this is number three very squirrely on the brakes guven has got nothing he can do Vecchio back up to that position he's just lost and sitting in the middle of the track which means that Guven can't throw it down the inside he's going to make contact with the wall Vecchio has managed to get himself back up into P number seven so early. They're both making contact with the wall. Guven down to the inside, through the corner. He, he, he got that position last time. And Vecchio keeps it. Oh, searching for the grip up on towards the back straight, but not able to find it. But what a move from Vecchio down the inside at turn number three. And now Vecchio has company. He has a friend because Evo Howler is now locked onto the back of Guven. So now he can just take a little bit of a break, knowing that Guven is being pressured from behind. But in turn, Howler is getting pressured by Cedric as well. So all of a sudden, Cedric has found not just one car ahead of him. He's found three cars ahead of him. And uh, he can get himself a fantastic amount of points there as Howler hits the wall and Cedric goes for the move coming in towards the final sector and he secures that move down the inside coming through towards the final two corners and that is no oh, he's going to be held there as uh, he takes that slide through the final two corners but Eva Haller will have 
an onboard with him, an onboard replay. You can see him, he'll hit the wall there. And that is all that Jack Cedric needs to get the opportunity and get himself by on the driver's right hand side. As a fantastic, uh, opportunistic move there from Jack Cedric. It does mean that uh, it has split up this battle pack a little bit for positions just inside of your top 10. But, and it does give a little bit of a break to uh, Guven and Beccio. But looking further forward, though, we do have Maximilian Wernig, Marcus Luchner and Marin Kolak. Reverse order, so that is going to be Wernig at the back. Luchner in the middle and Kolak at the front. And Wernig so close to the back, coming on the back. So it almost gives uh, the Williams Esports driver uh, a love tap coming up on towards the high-speed section now. But... Venick, he's not going to be close enough for a move here down in towards the slow speed section. Does set himself up for a uh, alternate line coming through here, but that didn't work there as Lohner has found himself in a, a very, very cozy sandwich here in this one, you have to argue, Jack. Yeah, Lohner doesn't look comfortable in that sandwich, though, as he head themselves out of the fountain section. They're going to have one more lap remaining in this event because Maximilian Beneke is going to come across the line soon. Lona moving to the middle of the track just to show Venig that he still wants to defend the position. Marin Kolak has got to worry about both of them behind because if anything happens, he's going to be the next one to be under pressure. Kolak leading the group around the final corner. White flag will fly. We have one lap remaining here at Belle Isle. Maximilian Venig into turn number one, into turn number two. They're going to stay single file. Yep, they will. And this is going to be one of the last over uh, last overtaking opportunities down in towards turn number three. But here comes Wernig then over Morris Lohner. He'll have to go around the outside the long way around at turn number three. It's going to be the long way at turn number four if he's able to hold it as well. But Wernig not able to get the position in towards turn number three. But the thing is that this that it doesn't mean that this battle is over. He does have a couple more opportunities to get himself alongside. And he gives a little bit of a tap to the Williams Esports driver of Morris Lohner looks at the outside coming down onto the corner before the back straight but the thing is he's still not able to get it Maximum Bonek is coming through towards the slow speed section right now. He'll come across the line and take the race win in just a couple of moments' time. But here comes Maximilian Venick then going for the move around the outside. Looks like forces Lona That's good defensive. Fantastic cut back door banging on the exit of the corner though. Lona has to take to the grass and he's not able to hold. He finds the concrete wall. He even comes across and blocks uh, Gianni Vecchio as well from getting through. So that is a particularly uh, spicy thing to happen. But the thing is, Maximilian Bonek, he's on the final final run to the line, Maximilian Beneke, dominant as ever, wins here at Belle Isle with Jared Philsell 1.2 seconds back in P number two, Alexander Thieb up in P number three as well. The rest of the runners will head their way across the line. Morris Lothner will have to settle for P number six after that fracas at the end of the event. There's a decent gaggle come across the line, Vecchio P number seven, Guven P number eight and Cedric number nine as well but we'll have a replay up on screen for you of that late race contact and oh boy this one's going to be uh, very interesting from Lona's perspective here Jack yeah you can see Lona moves to the outside moves to the inside Venning to the outside Lona just gets loose on the exit I think first touch and then did Lona just not turn into the corner at the right point and just go across the grass instead I'm not sure oh. whether the city of Detroit are paying him to cut the grass, but you can get another view coming out onto the back straight. Loder is already seeing the view very, or the pass very early on because he stays on that right-hand side for an extremely long time. On the run-up to the corner, you can see Venig drafting in the background, running on board with Loner again, still sticking to the middle of the track, a little bit loose. It was on the bounce off the curb. That's what it was. It was the power on the bounce off the curb. He then got loose into the left-hander. A little bit of attack from Maximilian Venig, and, well, that wall was very inviting and the block from Gianni Vecchio was probably what kept him in that position. Yeah, the, the block is a little bit naughty at the end of that uh, little sequence there but uh, we'll see how that one turns out in terms of the Iris and Stewart's but we'll see it once again the problem is he comes across the curb and then off to all his hairs at the corner and then this little move to block Vecchio is uh, uh, once we get it going is not the best thing to do even a little bit of contact there and Vecchio then has to try and defend from the car behind so uh, that one's a little bit naughty but the thing is it does keep Lona uh, in his P number six position right now and uh, there's still a decent chunk of points to take home but I think this is going to be about time now to go over your official race results.
going to be Maximilian Beneke taking the race win after taking pole position. 1.2 seconds over Jared Filsell with Alexandra Thebe taking the final step on the podium. And then there was the gaggle, the battle pack inside the top five. We've got Matt Baron Kolak, P number four. Maximum Venek, P number five, with Marcelona having to sell for P number six after the incident right at the end, with Vecchio, P7, uh, Guven, and Jack Sedgwick bring things down to P number nine, with Evo Howler rounding out the top ten. Then you've got a rather quiet race. It has to be argued for Juani Lopez. Didn't get himself involved in much, but ends up gaining three positions up into P number 11 with Oli Pakala, P number 12, Enzo Benito, P number 13, exactly where he started with Carol Franschak, P14, with Juni Heikkinen bringing things up in P number 15. Dennis Gorowski, P number 16, not the greatest of races for him as he loses five positions with Justin Brunner finishing P17, Logan Clamp at P18 with Joshua Anderson, Freddie Rasmussen, Dimitri Yanis, Patrick Holtzman, Ricardo Castroledo, and Sebastian Dunkel, all non-finishers, all big names in your non-finisher slots as well. But don't go away here on Racebot TV and on Yara Racing Esports Network because it is going to be the post-race show just after this. Goodbye. As a kid in Oklahoma, where I'm from, the Chili Bowl is the biggest race that we have. The Chili Bowl has kind of been my favorite race of the year. Growing up a dirt racer in Oklahoma, that's kind of the holy grail.
Well, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to post-race coverage from the first round of the Porsche Pro Qualifying Series. And, well, let's talk about the stats first of all. Strength for field, 7,500. Not as high as the strength for field on Friday, which was 7,794. What that means is even though Max Bonecke did win today, he will take home slightly less points than a winner of yesterday, that was Freddy Rasmussen, who we saw had a bit of a mare of a race here today. Will Vincent, Conny Maddock and Jack Styles are still here. Here is a look at your top 10 one more time. And it is Max Bonecke who claimed victory by 1.2 over Jared Philsell. Alexander Thieb in third place, Marin Kolak in fourth, Max Wenig rounding out your top five. With Maritz Lona, Gianni Vecchio, Ian Chan Guven, Jack Sedgwick, and Ivo Howler, the drivers who complete your top 10. Connery. Jared Phil Sell had a boring race. Boring <laughs> races is what gets you into the World Championship Series. Yeah, exactly. Uh, finishing P number two here is is a, still an absolutely fantastic point hill he can carry uh, in towards next week. So that is uh, still not a problem at all for Phil Sell. But uh, you know, that was, uh, for me, kind of surprising to see him up that far. I would have thought he would have been inside the top five, of course. But to be on par with Max Beneke, only shadowing him inside of a second until the, right at the very end there. That is a very, very impressive performance. Yeah, of course. Beneke, Jack had a pretty easy ride of it as well. Faster than qualifying. Led every single lap of this event. Didn't really have to push too hard, one would argue. But again, we haven't seen, in my opinion, Beneke at his full potential just yet. He's just looking, like many other drivers, to punch a ticket. But the easiest way of doing so is by winning races. Yeah, and I think that is definitely what Beneke is trying to do. You could tell by his driving style that he wasn't pushing hard. I think that was probably the most interesting thing about it. The fact that Gerard Filsall was able to stay onto the back of the, the driver of Beneke. But Filsall has got experience in cars very similar to this in the likes of the V8 supercar. Lots of power, not a lot of driving aids, but the V8 supercar is a little bit heavier. So the Porsche might come a little bit more naturally to Filsall. Obviously, Beneke winner of the ADAC Sim Racing Trophy last year, and also, also if I remember correctly, one of the winners of the Porsche Sim Racing Summit last month in uh, Leipzig. Yep. So he is also very experienced in this car. You've got two very quick drivers up at the front. Would have liked to see a battle between them. Would have been interesting to see who would have come out on that one on top, although my money would have still been on Beneke. Yeah, and it's also worth noting, we did have a bit of real-life driver feel in there as well with Ian Chan. He actually was the um, Porsche Cup front and Benelux champion in 2017. Well, let's, let's actually think back to the Porsche Sim Racing Summit, Connery, because... We had a little bit of real-life um, Porsche talent there as well. Nick Tandy, for example, he came home third in terms of the Porsche Sim Racing Summit with his teammate. Um, and it does show that, you know, the, the similarities between the iRacing version of the Porsche Cup car and the real-life Cup car can't be far too different because we've got some guys who's gone from the real world and doing pretty well right now in the Pro Series. Yeah, it was Nick Tandy with uh, Joshua Rogers going P number three at the Porsche Sim Racing Summit. And uh, yeah, exactly. There are just an absolute ton of uh, transferable skills that you can bring from the real world in the sim racing, from sim racing into the real world as well. And that's why we see these big motorsports, uh, these car manufacturers, these big motorsports players like Porsche start to come into this sort of area because they're seeing that this is a point of development for them. Yeah, indeed. So, of course, Porsche, in case you missed the news, held a sim racing summit at Leipzig uh, about a month ago from now. I mean, that was a hard one for us getting out there at such short notice, but a ton of fun doing so. And the key thing on that one, Connery, was the fact that it wasn't just a case of take 32 drivers, chuck them around in a couple of races and see who's going to be the winner. It was far more than that. Porsche really showing their determination in terms of entering the esports market the right way, having meetings of all the different drivers, focus groups, 
groups with team managers not just from the world of sim racing but the wider section of esports as well as other interested parties from the world of motorsports as well yeah, exactly. I did have the chance to sort of hang around in some of those meetings as a quote-unquote esports expert. Yeah, I don't know. But uh, it's, it's still absolutely fantastic what they're trying to do. They're trying to gain the fee feedback from the drivers to see what sort of series, what sort of events that the drivers want, what sort of events and, and uh, races that the sponsors want, like what the team managers want. It was all a huge dialogue between Porsche and the sim racing world, for the lack of a better term, to see how to do this right instead of just coming in and just going, hey, we're holding a race, and then just leave. Yeah, of course, uh, Jack. We talked about this already. It's a nine-race season. We're heading ourselves out for the next two races to Japan. Um, Scuba Circuit, first of all, uh, it's a track that many people probably grew up when they first took their first steps into online motorsports playing games um, in certain titles, which I'm probably not allowed to mention here. And then afterwards, you go to Twin Win Motegi, of course, Motegi track, which has been a part of iRacing for the last four years. Both of these tracks are very difficult, and... I'm going to mention it now. Japanese slippery tarmac will mean that we see a lot of drivers, I think, slipping off and has to be really careful how they navigate the brakes on this Porsche car. Obviously, Scuba, I think, is more famous in sim racing and mo and racing games, the wider genre outside of sim racing, than it is in real life motorsport because of, obviously, what was done by a certain franchise of, of, of game over the course of the last 20-odd sort of years. And Motegi, it's one of those circuits which is... Very, very complicated. It's on the E circuit as well, so it's not the full Grand Prix circuit. We're using a shortened version of it, and that's going to make it very interesting because I have a feeling, if I remember correctly, the East, the East circuit has got some quite interesting corners on that could make it very much like Turn 3 at the uh, Belle Isle circuit today where it very much widens down into the corner. Yeah, and of course we wrap up the season nine races. We go to Watkins Glen International, to Imola, to Mount Panorama. Yes, we challenge the mountain. We go back to Japan, to Suzuka, the Canadian Tires Motorsports Park, and we finish things off at Sebring. All of these tracks, Connery, in some way, shape or form, have had Porsche racing go down the years. Um, of course, we finish a track at Sebring, which, you know, is one of Porsche's bread and butter tracks. And it was really interesting hearing about the fact that a lot of um, Porsche teams over the years use the 12 hours of Sebring as a testing ground for the 24 hours of Le Mans. Because if you can handle the bumps and the messiness of doing 12 hours at Sebring, the, the smoothness of Le Mans all of a sudden seems a little bit easier. Yeah, it does. And it would be a fantastic finale to this season once we get to that round number nine. But next week, we have the Tsukuba circuit with also Tim Ringmotegi the week after as well. So a little bit of a jaunt over to Japan to try and get those races sorted. But uh, Tsukuba, that's going to be a very, very interesting one, Will, because it's a new track on the iRacing service. Uh, a lot of these drivers will have had experience in this track with other sims as well and uh you know it's one of those famous tracks in that respect so that is going to be uh and a, a close quarters affair because it is quite a short circuit quite a fast lap time so these guys might even be engaging touring car mode yeah, indeed. So that, however, is all we have time for here today. Thank you to Conor Maddock and Jack Styles for the call of this one. Let's also give a shout out to the people who help us get it done. Islam Balau, trackcams22.com, Andres One and And One Design for these beautiful overlaying graphics that you see. Development and stuff behind the scenes, Simon Grossman, AppGeneering.com and Nick Thiston for Racebot TV live timing and scoring. So that is it then from the first round of the Porsche Pro Qualifying Series. Max Maneke took victory here today, but it will be Freddy Rasmussen who still has command of the point standings due to his victory last night. Who knows what will happen when we come back in one week's time and we head ourselves to the Far East. From Jack Styles, Conor Maddock, I'm Will Vincent. Good night and goodbye from Detroit and Belle Isle.